asked us for nickels, and then he gave them away. So essentially, we had to pay him to do a children's story. So I think that was his way of getting out of it in the future. <laughs> but I do want to say, I do want to say, if you want to get some tips on how to catch big pike, you need to talk to Gary's granddaughter, Alyssa. But I have a feeling that she's not going to tell you where she went based on the size of that pike. It was a monstrous fish. Anyways, huh? Looked pretty big to me. <laughs> I thought, boy, I'd like to catch one that size. Anyways, how's everybody doing? Raise your hand. Now, I'm going to shame you a little bit, but don't worry. You won't be alone. Raise your hand if you have not started in our Bible reading plan this year. Okay, so there's about half, 50-50, so that's good. It's not too late to catch up. You can get a plan out there. Start with the days that we're on and proceeding on because we're going to uh, continue preaching a sermon out of, those, out of those passages every single Sabbath. But uh, what you can do is just add one extra chapter from the ones you missed before. You've only missed about 30 chapters or so. There's a little bit more in this first week. So if you just add one every single day as you go on, you'll be caught up within a month and then you'll be right on the same page. Now, the reason why we're doing this is because we used to be known as the people of the book. We used to be known as the people of the book. But how can we be people of the book if we're not reading the book? Kind of hard, isn't it? Now, the object of reading the Bible is not to learn what you're doing wrong. It's to replenish the joy of salvation in your heart. It's to meet the God of the book. It's to meet the God who created you. It's to meet the God who wants to have a relationship with you. It's to have a personal walk with him, and it's him talking back to you. And every part of the Bible is inspired, so we want to read every chapter. So we're going through this in a year, and every sermon is going to come out of the selected reading that is in the, in the, in the paper you can get out there. So having said that, why don't we get into our Bibles today and look for some nickels under rocks? Let's pray. Father, I just ask that you will bless us as we continue into our sermon today. I just pray that this will find a way into our hearts, that it will... Move us, Lord, to want to be more like you, that it will increase our faith to realize how powerful you are and what you can do if we just choose to acknowledge that you are correct and that you are right. And Lord, I pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit because I just have some fodder on some paper, but you have power. And I pray that you give us that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So some seem to feel they have solved the riddle of creation by pushing it back a billion or a hundred billion years into the past. And it doesn't matter which, because nobody has any idea of how much a billion is anyways. Do you guys have any idea how much a billion is? Any billionaires in here? No. All right, let me ask you this question. Does anybody know, can you, can you compute in your head how far ago a thousand seconds is? It's not very far. You guys know that, right? How about a million seconds? Can you compute that one? Hmm? Close. It's about 17 days ago. How many of you can tell me how, many, how far back a billion seconds is? Huh? 33. Point two years ago. We can't fathom what a billion is. If you started counting now, there's a good chance you might pass away before you got there. It's a big number, all right? So it doesn't matter if it's 100 billion years in the past or a billion years in the past. It's far enough back. Scientists push it far enough back that your mind can't comprehend it anyways. And they just push it back a few billion years and leave the impression that anything that started that long ago just started by itself. But this sort of thinking solves nothing. Whether 6 billion or 6 million or 6,000 years ago, nothing can originate out of nothing. It doesn't even make sense. Logically, for something to exist, it had to come from something. So if nothing came from nothing, then it had to create itself, and that's impossible. So just the thought of something existing tells us that there's a creator. 
Every existence cannot come from non-existence. Every effect must have an adequate, adequate cause. In other words, creation must have had a creator. In the beginning, that's Genesis 1.1, are the sublime words with which the Bible, the book of Genesis, begins, and no philosophy can ever back, can go back of those words. The reality is, is that this world started with God. Let's look at that today. Let's look at that today. Go to Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. I want to show you something, and then I'm going to show you another verse, and then I'm going to lead you into a quandary, and then I'm going to take you out of that quandary today. All right? That's the whole point. I'm going to lead you into confusion, and then I'm going to bring you out of confusion, and then I'm going to show you how that confusion helps your life today. All right? That is the plan, and I don't know if I'll be successful at it, but I'm going to try. So if you have any questions, let me know when we get done. So Genesis 1, 1. 1, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, if we read that verse, it sounds like God came here, and there was some flump of matter, some form, something that was without form and without void, and then he created the earth with that. But if we go to Hebrews 11.3, we're going to see that we have a little problem. So hold your fingers here and go to Hebrews 11.3. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. Hebrews 11, verse 3. Now we know that Genesis just said that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And then if we would have read into verse 3, then he says, let there be light, blah, blah, blah. And then the second day, he creates something. And the third day, the fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, so on and so forth. You understand, right? But Hebrews 11.3 gives us a little bit of a challenge. Hebrews 11, verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, the things that we see today did not come from something that appeared. That is to say that God didn't make a more beautiful rock out of a lesser rock. God didn't make multiply the mountains out of a mountain. God didn't sprinkle the trees throughout the hillsides from a tree. He created the things that we see from things that didn't appear. So I have a question for you. If God created something out of nothing, ex nihilo, that's the Latin word for something out of nothing, out of nothing, ex nihilo, we believe, as Adventists, we believe in, in creation, ex nihilo, by the way. If God created something out of nothing, how do we explain verse 2 in Genesis chapter 1? How do we explain verse 2? How could there be matter already there if God created something out of nothing? Because if we just read it as it reads, doesn't it look like matter existed and then God did something with it? No. So how do you explain it? Void means that there was something there. Without form and void, it means that there was a matter, a wilderness, desolate thing, and then it had nothing in it. Go ahead. Okay, so he created the matter, but it was without, without, without form. Okay, I, I'm going to agree with you, but I'm going to take it a little further. Now, there's two different theories. Well, there's actually three or four, but there's two different theories out there that Adventists ascribe to for the most part. Number one is we just take it, we just accept it. God created, we can't explain it. He just says that it happened. That's just the way it is. It's just created, okay? Now, that's fine that he created in, in, a six, in six literal 24-hour periods. And that's fine. I agree with that, that he did do that. But it does lead to some problems that we cannot answer. And the reason why that's a problem is because there are very good faithful Seventh-day Adventists who have studied science and they have legitimate questions that they say, listen, we can't just accept that because it goes against every law of science that God set up. And if God is the author of the laws of science, then this can't be true. In other words, God could not have created the earth, a young earth, 6,000 years ago in six literal 24 hours days. That can't be true. 
based on some of other scientific facts that are out there. Now, I want to say something. I agree with that. So how many of you are confused right now? How many of you are questioning your pastor and thinking he's not an Adventist anymore? Okay, let's look at this now. There is a, there is a theory out there that can help explain this. Now, remember, Hebrews 11.3 is very clear that everything that was created was created out of what? Nothing. Yes, we're going to get to that later. So God created everything out of nothing. I 100% agree with the Bible, right? Now, let's look at this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What is that referencing, the heaven and the earth? It's referencing what? It's referencing everything. It's referencing the universe. It's referencing the earth. It's referencing everything that was created. That's what it's doing. And then in verse 2, he goes on and he says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In other words, we run into a problem here. There's two ways to translate this in Hebrew. It's either a dependent clause or an independent clause. Now, we're getting to some grammar, so Candy might have to help us. Independent would mean that verse 1 is a complete sentence in and of itself, and it's completely independent of verse 2. Verse 2 is another sentence, complete, in and of itself. You can translate it as two complete sentences independent of one another. Or, traditionally, we have translated it as dependent. Verse 1 is dependent on verse 2. Now I'm gonna sub I'm going to I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna propose to you that you should look at it as an independent clause. That you should look at verse one independent of verse two. And if you do that, then you have to do two things. You have to recognize that there's two viewpoints here. There's the human viewpoint, and then there's God's viewpoint. Now let's start with the human viewpoint. For us, this explains our existence. For us, this tells us where we came from. For us, this tells us where the world came from. It gives us an explanation. And as believers in Jesus Christ and as believers in God and as believers of creation, we use this to tell other people who may or may not believe that, that this is where we came from. So we use this as a proof text to show others that God created everything. So from our viewpoint, we come from there. Now let's look at the problems with um, with our with with um, with our viewpoint, so that God created the heavens. The heavens referring to the universe in this case, and the earth in six little literal twenty four hour days. Now, scientists will of course tell us that this is impossible, and that we believe in pseudoscience. Then they will point out the problems with our theory. So let's look at the problems if we believe that God just created everything all in one shot. Number one. The reference in verse 2 to the deep and the waters, what is this deep? What is nothingness, or was it something? Even if it was just a watery blob, if something was here before day one, then creation week did not include the creation of everything. That's the pro If you look at it as dependent clause, that's one issue you have. Number two, there are other biblical passages classically interpreted by Adventists, Adventists as referring to sentient beings who existed before the creation of the earth, such as Job 38, 7 and Isaiah 14, 12. In other words, there were created beings that literally watched creation before the creation of the earth. How could they do that if this is dependent? Number three, Squeezing the creation of everything observed by astronomers, uh, astronomers into a few days, 6,000 years, is a bit difficult. In other words, astronomers look at the sky and they say, this can't be 6,000 years. It's impossible. Now let's look at these objections and I'll explain to you how we can reconcile that and still believe in biblical creation in six literal 24-hour days. So these are the questions we are left to answer. Now, there are two ways to look at it. I already talked about the dependent and independent clause. So let's talk about the new independent clause. The new independent clause is what we're looking at right now. Another view of the creation account is that verse 1 is independent of verse 2. Therefore, verse 1 is a declaration that God created everything. And then verse 2 comes back and deals with the creation of the, of the earth. Now, this theory has a passive gap between God creating the universe and some 
voidless, formless lump of matter that we call earth now and when he created everything else. In other words, God spoke everything into existence and for whatever his purposes were, he left the earth in a formless state and went and did other things with his time. In that time, it would include in creating the other angelic beings, it would create, you know, the other galaxies, the other matter, whatever it was, God was working on those purposes before he came back to earth. Now, I'm not trying to limit God here. I'm not saying that God couldn't have done it all at once. He just chose not to. This was his plan. This is what he decided to do. And for whatever reason, he had his purposes with that. And if we decide to agree with that thought, number one, that solved the problem why there is a lump of matter that is without form and void when God starts creating the world, it gives a great explanation for the verses in the Bible that refers to angels observing creation. It also sheds light on the fact that we see light on earth being relatively a new world. Now let me explain that for a second, because I know that was probably confusing the way I worded it. It takes four... Let me see if I had this right. I think it takes eight minutes, just over eight minutes, eight minutes, 30 seconds, eight minutes, 32 seconds, something like that, for the light of the sun to get to earth. So the light that you see from the sun literally appeared eight minutes before you see it. All right? Now, if we go to the next nearest star, not the sun, but the next nearest one to earth, if we go to Proxima Centauri, it takes four years and three days for the light from that star to reach the earth. Now, if we go to the furthest star that NASA can observe with telescope or whatever they have, it takes nine billion years for that light that we are observing now to reach earth. If God created everything just like that on the same time with no gap in between, how do we explain that? I don't accept that. I'm sorry. I don't accept that. And the reason why I don't accept that is because he gave us his laws of science to study and understand. They're his laws. We didn't make them up. He did. Now, this is how we can explain that. God created everything just like that, but he didn't fill the earth. He left it a formless lump, and it might have been billions of years before he came back to it. And then when he came back to it in verse 2, when it says the world's without form and void, tahu vabohu, that means that it was without form and unfilled. And then the rest of creation, the rest of Genesis chapter 1, explains to us God completing creation. Earth was the final piece of creation that God did in the heavens and the earth. And thus for, when he concluded in Genesis 2, chapter 1, he's saying, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Genesis chapter 1 is him telling us that we were the last created piece. Now you might say, why would he do that? I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. But I truly believe in the independent clause theory, the new independent clause theory. I believe that that gives us an explanation for why everything exists, why we can see the light from the stars, and it still allows for God to create everything just like that. All right? Ex nihilo, he created everything out of nothing. Now, this is just a human viewpoint. This is how we look at verse 1 to explain it, but verse 1 is more than a theological summary for humanity. Verse 1 is also a declaration of fact from God. In other words, when we look at verse 1, it explains our existence. It helps us to understand where we come from. But God doesn't need to understand that because he was there, he did it. God doesn't need to explain it because he made it happen. So for him, it has a complete different meaning, and yet it still holds a meaning. So why does God put in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? What is that declaration of fact? What is the purpose for that? Amen? So in other places in the Bible, he goes on to tell us why this is important. He gives us a reason why we should worship him. Nehemiah 9.6, you are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heavens of heavens, 
with all their hosts, the earth and all that is them and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. So part of the reason why he puts this declaration of fact in there in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, is so that we will know who we are to worship. Again, in Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. But that's not the only reason why he put that declaration of fact in there. He declares he is a creator to show us that there is no other God. Everything else that is worshipped besides God is just an idol. Psalms 96.5, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord, Jehovah, made the heavens. Again, we see when he's dealing with Zoroastrianism, this is a tough one to say, Zoroastrianism, the, the religion of the Medo-Persians at the time, the dualistic nature that they had, where they had one God who was good and another lesser God who was evil and brought all the evil on the world. When God was dealing with that, he gave another reason to worship him and to know that he was the one calling Cyrus to come and deliver the Israelites out of Babylon. In Isaiah 45, verses 5 through 8, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Now he's going to use a merism. He's going to contrast two opposite points to prove that he is God. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may, be, may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. So he says, you can be assured that I'm the one delivering you or the, the, the Babylonians into your hand because I am the creator, not your false gods that you set up. But he gives us more reasons. He also uses this declaration of fact to give us evidence that his word is true. In Isaiah 45, 18 and 19, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who formed the earth and made it, he established it, he did not create it empty, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. So he says, you can listen to what I am saying. I'm going to give you the truth. My word has to be right because my word was what created everything you see. And then he gives us more reasons. And then he tells us how this declaration of creation happened through David. Psalms 148, 2 through 5. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Psalms 33, 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Now, these are all very important purposes for that declaration of fact that God gives us to start the Bible as we start reading it. But I believe there's a higher purpose involved in it. And for that, we're going to have to go to another selection of our reading to this, this past week, Genesis 18. Go to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 there is a reason why God is declaring that he made everything out of nothing. And I want to show you this. Genesis chapter 18. Not only so that we will worship him, not only so we won't worship idols, not only so that we'll believe that he's declaring truth, but there's another fact more personal that he's trying to get across to our minds. He's trying to build our faith in his power and his ability to do what he says that he can do. Now turn me Genesis 18. We're going to look at verse 9. Genesis 18, verse 9. Genesis 18, verse 9. And when they said unto him, this is, this is, this is the, 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 the Lord, this is Jesus and the angels talking to, to Abraham and Sarah right before they go in to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? 
And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife will have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. Now I just want to pause just for say, well, I'll read the next verse, then I'll pause. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old and I have I, I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. In other words, Sarah is saying, What you're saying is impossible. The reason why it's impossible is because I have completed my menstrual cycles. I have been through menopause. I no longer have eggs in my body. I've dispelled them all. I don't have that anymore. And yet, you say, then I'm going to have a child. How is that possible? Well, I just want that to set in for a second. Because when it comes to childbirth, this is the second greatest miracle in the Bible. The first, of course, being Mary, being a virgin, having a child. This is right along those lines because Sarah, scientifically, is unable to have children. She cannot bear them. Now, they've tried everything. Abraham desperately wanted to have a kid. More than anything, he wanted a son to take on his name. They tried raising a son through one of his servants. That wasn't a good plan. Sarah felt so bad for him. She said, Abraham, why don't you take one of my servants and actually birth your own child through her? Maybe he can be the chosen one. But God comes and says, that's not my plan. That's not what I'm asking from you. He says, Sarah, you're going to have a child. Now, what I find amusing about this is that she hears this in the tent door and she laughs. <laughs> God, come on. <laughs> Who are you? What do you mean? <laughs> have a child. It's not possible. I mean, I wish it were. I've tried so hard all these years. We tried and we tried and we tried and we wanted it to happen, but it couldn't happen. <laughs> it's impossible now. She had come to the point where she had got so desperate that she gave up on the idea altogether. And now the thought of her having a kid was a joke. And it was humorous even to her. But God said, you're going to have a kid. And then if you read further, she gets in an argument with God. She says, I didn't laugh. And he says, yeah, you did. And that concludes this passage. God literally brought Isaac from nothing. He came from nothing. There was no egg inside Sarah to be fertilized. And yet one year later, Isaac was born. Ex nihilo. It was impossible because there was no matter to make a son. So what did God do? He made the matter to make the son. Ex nihilo. Creation out of nothing. Now what does that teach you? God doesn't need your help to make you an overcomer. Ex nihilo. He creates something out of nothing. God doesn't need you to strive 
to fulfill his plan because he creates something out of nothing. What God needs from you is to acknowledge that he has the power to do it. What God needs from you is to acknowledge that his ways are better than your ways. What God needs from you is to make the decision to to be in his presence, to make the decision to allow him to do what he wants to do. That's what God needs from you. He doesn't need your effort. He needs your decisions. And he says that if you just choose to let me do what I want to do, I will create something out of nothing. Now, here's the thing. Abraham and Sarah had tried year after year after year after year to have a kid. They tried until she dried up and physically it was impossible anymore. And after that, Sarah said, go take Tamar. Have a kid with her. I'm sorry, Hagar. Have a kid with her. It wasn't until they completely gave up and just acknowledged God's ways that he created something out of nothing. He can do the same for you. I don't care how long you've struggled with that addiction. God can create something out of nothing, and what he needs from you is to acknowledge that he has the power to do it. He needs you to hearken back to the story of creation and say, God, you're creator. You made everything I see out of nothing that appears. You can do the same for me. No one can say that I am overburdened with the temptation that can't be overcome because God can create something out of nothing. Even if someone said, I was born this way, I'm just destined to be this. God could literally change the way that you were born. That's the point of ex nihilo. God needs us to understand that he doesn't need a platform to work off. He just needs us to choose to let him do it. Do you believe it? When you look at big creation, do you see the power of God? Do you see what he can do? And do you apply that to your life? Do you have faith right now as you sit where you're at to accept that God can make you what he wants you to be? Now do you have the information, the knowledge to understand that you'll never make yourself that way, but God will if you choose to allow him to. God can't force you to let him do what he wants you to do. There's rules of engagement. But if you say, God, I'm giving you the choice. I acknowledge you're right. I acknowledge you have the power. I'm just going to come and be in your presence because faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Here's the best thing about it. This is the most beautiful thing about what I'm trying to tell you. You don't even have to have faith in God that he can do it. You just have to acknowledge that he can because he will put the faith in you. Somewhere along the way, I was an atheist. I actively argued against God and didn't even believe in him. And somehow he made me a pastor. Somewhere along the way, I was hopelessly addicted to drugs and to alcohol and to cigarettes and any other thing you could think of. And somehow God got me through that. Not because I decided to be better than everybody else, but because slowly but surely God created even a desire in my heart to not want to live that lifestyle anymore. He created a faith in me to look to him and acknowledge him and trust in him. And somehow he even got me to accept that he could do what he promised that he would do. And then instead of me toiling and struggling, God created something out of nothing. And when we look at the trees around us, and when we look at the rocks around us, that didn't come from other rock, it didn't come from other tree. It came from the word of God, just like that. And if your Christian experience has been one of I do good, I do good, I do good, I feel good about myself, I feel good about my salvation, only to have calamity hit and strike you down and to fall back. I have bad news for you. You're an evolutionist. Because God doesn't teach that. God speaks into existence what is real. And it doesn't matter how you feel about that. We've got to stop looking 
at creation through our viewpoint. We got to start looking at it through God's viewpoint. We've got to stop making promises to God. And we need to start claiming the promises of God. He creates ex nihilo. No, I'm not saying that you're going to walk out of here and be changed just like that. But what I am telling you is that if you acknowledge God and you say, God, I want it your way, I want to do what you have in store for me, somehow he will make it happen. If he has to put the desire in your heart, he'll put the desire there. If he has to put the faith in your, in your brain to believe, he'll put the faith there. When he has to put the power there, he'll put the power there. He doesn't need anything except a choice from you to let him do what he wants to do out of nothing. Because God creates out of nothing. And that is the point of Genesis 1. 1. Do you believe today that God created everything you see out here out of nothing? Do you believe that he spoke it into existence? Now, here's the kicker. I don't care if you believe in the dependent clause or independent clause because all of that is independent of salvation. What I want you to take away from this is that no matter what you believe, there's explanations for your faith, so you don't have to be ashamed of it. You don't have to think you practice pseudoscience because you believe in creation. But more importantly, what I want you to take away from this is God creates out of nothing. He doesn't need anything. He makes it. And when we start looking at creation from his viewpoint, our lives are going to change. When we accept it through his viewpoint, our lives are going to change. And when we stop making the promises to God and start claiming the promises of God, our lives are going to change. Because the story of Sarah and Abraham illustrate that God doesn't need us. He wants us to make a choice to let him do what he can do and only he can do. Now, I want to know today. I don't need to know that you're struggling. I already know that. I don't need to know that you feel guilt. I already know that. What I need to know today is do you recognize? I don't even want you to tell me you believe it. I just want you to tell me that you recognize, you believe it's truth. You, you accept it as truth that God creates something out of nothing. And I want you to recognize one more thing. God wants to do that in your life. Will you let him? Will you let him? Okay, your response has got much less. I heard two people say, yes, I want God to do in my life what he wants to do. What are the rest of you doing here then? Do you want God to do in your life what he wants to do? Amen. Our closing hymn. Is number 86.